over to you, Ian. Okay, thank you. Um, I can't start my video. Okay, so uh, Sean, would you like to have a look at that, please? Oh, I'm a co-host now, so I probably can. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I shall start sharing my screen. Okay, can everybody see see my slides? Yes, we can. Brilliant, thanks very much, John, thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about AI sketch visualization and end to prototyping in design. Um, and really the, the, the sort of background for, for this um, paper is that we have AI, which obviously is a sort of classic disruptor technology. In other words, a technology that's got the capacity not only to affect how people work, but actually the whole structure of, of the industries they work in. Um, and I think we're also very, very comfortable with the idea that, you know, um, in lots of industries, there'll be huge effects on employment. You know, we're thinking about taxi driving, but also, um, uh, you know, distribution and retail, and that sort of thing. We're expecting that. Um, but at the same time, there have been a number of commentators who sort of looked at the, the rise of, you know, of human replacement by robots and by artificial intelligence, and have identified creative thinking and decision making, um, along with some manual handling, as the areas that will be least affected by this change. And I think that's read, led to a sort of an assumption that's quite widely held, particularly by those of us in, in those industries, that actually will be much less affected than other, other industries, and that actually um, you know, we, we don't need to worry about the rise of the machines because we're in an area that the machines can't actually make much of a, a difference to. And I suppose I'm really examining how well founded that assumption is. And I'm starting out from the viewpoint um, that those of those who work in design industries are well aware of, but those who work outside it are not. And that's the design processes are not homogeneous. In other words, they are not the same all the way through. Typically, there are stages in design processes, um, you know, and at each of those stages, there'll be different activities and different outcomes. Um, and one of the things that we recognize is that as job roles have become more specialized, there are particular um, uh, activities associated with different stages in the design process, meaning that um, actually, one can't give a blanket assurance that employment won't be affected by the rise of AI, um, because actually some parts of that process are more sensitive and are perhaps more um, vulnerable to replacement than others. So, th so that's, my, that's the sort of field I'm looking at. Um, to start off with, I, I want to give a sort of working definition of artificial intelligence. And here, uh, I'm really talking about a quite a limited um, definition of AI, so I'm not trying to, you know, there's probably people watching this who know a lot more about it than me. My definition is quite simple, really. On the one hand, it's a scalable computer-based system. In other words, it's the system that is digital, it's essentially digital, and it can grow from small to very, very large without any problems. It's able to access, obviously, a lot of data, and from that data, it can produce appropriate outset, outputs, um, where the connection between the range of data and the required output is non-trivial. In other words, it's not like looking up something in a telephone box, a telephone book, or um, you know, or, or just um, doing a search for an email address or something. It's a difficult and complex relationship. Um, so things might be, you know, identifying images which contain doors. And here we, I've got a picture there of of um, a fairly recent image object identification output, um, or identifying possible illnesses based on a set of symptoms. Um, so, you know, those are difficult things to do, but AI is actually quite good at doing those. Um, now, of course, you know, uh, designers, I'm, I'm very glad to say, don't usually actually try and work out what's wrong with someone from their symptoms. Um, so we need to think, how might AI actually integrate with, with designers? And I think there's, there's two ways, really. Um, the first one is, is a sort of recognition. You know, if, if, a, if the AI knows what you're trying to do, it can help you to do it better. And it can actually help you to do it better based on solutions it's known about from other similar situations. Um, 
So, you know, if it knows what cats look like and it thinks you're trying to draw a cat, it can, it can suggest appropriate solutions based on other drawings of cats that people have done. And the other um, big area where I think AI can really help designers um, is in the control of multiple parametric systems. You know, we're used to things like animations or, or um, VR scenes, that sort of thing, where there's an awful lot of stuff going on and actually uh, sifting through all the possibilities um, with all the myriad different ways you can change those things is very difficult for a person. But AI can actually help that and give controls which are intuitive, but actually make sense in terms of the design um, uh, imperatives. So if AI is a, a disruptive um, technology, and if there are potential ways it can combine with, um, with, with the design processes, I think it's worth looking at what disruption means, because it will help us look at this. Bit. So disruptive technologies was introduced by Christensen in 1997 in a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. And he looked at really um, changes in technology um, and, and how they developed over time. And if you can see in that graph on the, on the right there, the blue line at the top is, is the classic, you know, you, you build something, you build it better. You know, if it's a washing machine, maybe you work out a dual drum or something, you know, it gets a little bit better year on year. Um, and it, 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 everyone loves it, you know, um, it works well enough to be adopted by people who've got the lowest um, common needs, but also it's got additional features and more are added over time so that um, it can meet the sort of high-end needs as well. Now, a disruptive technology is different um, because basically when they start out, and this is the crucial point, they're not as good as current ways of doing things. In fact, they're much less good. They don't even meet the needs of the least demanding customers. However, because they're generally technological, um, they, are, they can be developed. You know, in other words, the problem, the performance issue is one that can be solved. And I think we're all um, used to this in computing. I remember talking to some of my students about using Photoshop in the early days. You know, they, they couldn't believe that actually you change a filter and then you go away for 10 minutes while Photoshop rendered that filter because they're so used to real-time operation of filters. You know? And we were talking about how the design process ch is changed when the iterative loop is, is very, very slow. Um, so they're not as, as capable as current approaches when um, disruptive technology is first introduced, but it has additional features which can produce value in the long run. And Christensen says, he says, products based on disruptive technologies, oh, hang on, we've, we've gone back. Uh, Products based on disruptive technologies are typically cheaper, simpler, smaller, and frequently more convenient to use. So those things we need to bear in mind and what we really need to look for in terms of, uh, of design, the design process is we need to look for new technologies, which at the moment are, are far less good than humans, you know, sometimes laughably poor, but their, their performance is just a matter uh, of actual development of technological and, and software development. Uh, but they've also got features which if they were as good as they could be, actually would be much cheaper and much uh, quicker um, and more convenient. And if you can look at that graph, you can see that the, the disruptive, the yellow line there, it, it comes in after the established technologies are there. It doesn't meet the needs of even the least demanding customers, but it rapidly, first of all, gets to meet the needs of, of, of least demanding customers, um, and then continues rapidly to meet the needs of, uh, of the most demanding customers. Um, so, you know, one thing we need to remember is that um, most customers don't, are not the most demanding customers. You know, most customers are actually the least demanding customers. At a conference like this, it's obviously um, biased because, you know, we're all interested in the cutting edge and the most developed um, uh, iterations of technologies. But if you look at graphic design, for example, um, you know, most graphic designers used to the bread and butter work used to be in corporate stationery, very undemanding, very repetitive. There's almost none of that work around anymore because, you know, disruptive technologies have taken that over and non-specialists can now for most of the time produce work that is good enough. And that phrase good enough is something, again, we need to take forward um, because it actually helps to us to identify and remember that we're not looking at the most demanding applications. We're looking at the, the, the everyday, the run of the mill, which make up most of the work 
but actually take the least skill. So if we're looking at design processes, there's an awful lot of them. Uh, I think you can see, I've just put some of the common models up there. I'm sure all of you will notice your favorite model. Um, different labeling, you know, different, different numbers of steps. Some people have five, some people have six, seven, um, there's 11 or 13 steps, there's a lot. Um, but you know, we, from these, we can develop a sort of generic model and saying, you know, you, you, you start off by trying to identify what is needed. Um, and that could involve some research. You then generate some possible solutions. That's often done through sketching. You then develop some sort of details of the design and, and that, that's often done through prototyping. And then you evaluate and you realize and, and you deliver and that sort of thing. Um, so looking at that, um, I want to just concentrate on two of those phases of the design process, um, sketching and prototyping. And first of all, in terms of sketching, one of the surprising things about sketching is it is absolutely ubiquitous, you know, uh, across all of um, the design field. Everyone seems to do it. Everyone does it in different ways, um, you know, and there are conventions in different areas of practice, but it, it's absolutely ubiquitous. Um, and just to think about some of the characteristics of sketching, which give an idea about why it's so well used. The first is it's low investment. In other words, you don't have to put a lot of time or a lot of expensive kit into doing it. Um, you don't, you know, you, you aren't afraid of throwing it away because you haven't actually spent too much spend in inverted commas there on producing it. So it's low investment and it's fast. Sketching is always very, very rapid and it feeds into that iterative loop whereby you can do something, you can look at it and then you can change it again very quickly. Um, sketching is also generally low fidelity and that's not a fault in it, that is seen as one of the advantages of it um, because it means that you don't have to consider the whole design necessary um, you know, every detail, you can just have a rough outline overview of a design uh, and from that you can actually make um, decisions or make beginning evaluations uh, of that design. They're also usually partial, you know, it's, it's odd to have a sketch that includes every detail of something. Um, normally you'd have a, some overview sketches and then you'd sketch some details and you'd look just at those details. So those are some of the characteristics of sketching and, and to think about what sketching enables designers to do, is first of all, of course, they allow them to explore the design space, to find out and, and work their way through what, what might be possible and what the requirements are and that sort of thing. Um, also, very importantly, it provides the capacity that really major decisions can be made very early on in the process. And of course, the earlier you make a big decision about a design outcome, whether it's a building or a website or a database system or a, a VR, you know, the cheaper it is because you haven't done that investment into making that actually involves the expense in design. And lastly, sketching does provide a way, um, imperfect and, 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 you know, um, partial of communicating the essence of initial ideas to other people. Sketching is that point where an idea comes out of your head and moves into a limited social space, typically with a design team, but you know it is possible to produce sketches that you could show to, uh, more widely if that was usable. Um, so, so yes, that, that's that. Now a prototype is, is different. Um, a prototype really is an important um, way that people will define a design. They actually, you know, pin down the details and that sort of thing. Um, if production is difficult, uh, prototypes again can help problem solve that and work out how exactly how things are going to fit together or things are gonna be produced. And really importantly, uh, um, they help to communicate the design to other people. Uh, so they, they show them what it'll be like, they show them how it'll work in their life, um, they show how it will be implemented. Uh, and also a, a prototype can show how things fit together, you know, we talked about how, how sketches are often partial, a prototype can, or some sort of prototype, can actually help put the different elements of, of a system together and show users or clients what, how it will actually work in totality. Um, so a prototype, uh, Howell and Hill call this representation of a design idea, has got two things we need to think about really. One of them is the resolution, um, you know, the level of detail in a prototype. I've got a, a 3D printed prototype there on the screen, you know, obviously quite a lot of detail. Other prototypes are not necessarily so detailed, you know, they may explore a, a production feature or something. In other words, they may not be very detailed, but they may help to show that, you know, a certain sort of concrete will work or a, a certain sort of fabric will work. 
Um, and the other thing about a prototype is its fidelity. And again, um, there are a whole range of fidelities that are possible. You know, some of you will be very familiar with the idea of paper-based prototyping, where actually the, the closeness to the final design is not that close, but you're still able to, to find out or communicate or identify important things about the finished product through using prototypes. So what are prototypes used for? They, firstly, they're used for simulation. You know, they're like the finished design. Um, they help to show and communicate to people what it would be like without you having to build the final design. Um, they also allow you to explore and evaluate the final design. You know, what would a building be like if, as you walk across the, the gantry or something, you know? Um, what will a fabric be like? What will a, a VR world be like? Um, and they help to communicate a design to non-specialist users. They also help to establish a shared understanding. It's very important, particularly with large projects or projects that are virtual or very, very expensive, that actually everybody understands what the product is and what the product's going to be before the money is spent on production. Um, and so, the, uh, you know, a prototype, particularly if it's quite a high um, fidelity prototype, um, can help to give everyone that security that we're all, you know, talking about the same product and we're all got the same expectations of what it will deliver. Okay, I'm going to look at a couple of examples now. Um, I could have chosen a lot more, but obviously, you know, time and all that sort of thing. Um, so the first one is the Sketch to Code, which is Microsoft. Two years ago, they started it. Um, it's a free public um, thing. And basically, you take a handwritten sketch, here we are, and you show it to your computer camera, and then you get the HTML for that as a website back. Um, I have to say, I've tried it a number of times. There are some things it finds much more easy to recognize than others, but you know it works. It does work, um, and you know it's part of the reason why I've always been very against people learning to code because coding will disappear. Machines will be better at coding than humans will be. Um, Tom Hume, who works for Google's investment arm, said um, deep machine learning will likely automate the writing of code relatively quickly. Well, it's useful to know what comprises language or algorithms. I suspect most of the latter will be written by machine against a specific human or eventually machine query. Creativity is going to be far more important in the future where software can code better than we can. Um, and I think the other thing to remember is that there are a lot of research efforts here aimed at producing AI helpers for, for people who want to write code but aren't coders. And they're typically um, helping them get things like the UX right. So actually, you know, at the moment, for most products, you have to have a developer, as I'll talk about in my conclusion slide, which we're getting towards, John. Um, you know, um, more and more, you know, we're seeing that coding is becoming a space where actually non-coders will be able to produce good enough code because they've got these tools behind them. Uh, the next thing I want to look at is, is architecture um, and a great project um, by Stanislas Chayu um, from last year, Archigan. Again, there is, um, a, a, a public web-facing thing where you can try this out. Basically, it's a multi-layered um, uh, AI system, machine learning system, um, where he noticed that actually um, from the plot of land a building's going to be on, you can make some very good predictions about what the shape of the building is going to be. And from the shape of the building, you can then make a very good set of predictions about what the internal layout of the building will be and where the doors and windows will be. And then once you've got that, you can then make very good predictions of what the furniture will be and where it will be and that sort of thing. Now, when I say predictions, obviously what the AI is doing is looking at tens of thousands of plots of land, mostly in the city of Boston for some reason. Um, and from that, it's looking at the buildings in those plots of land. And then it's looking at all the different shapes of those buildings. And it's coming up with things, not by random, but what good human designers have done in the past. And then it's looking at building shapes and saying, what are and thousands, tens of thousands of building shapes and internal layouts and saying, what are the good decisions? What are the decisions that architects have made in the past? And then, you know, what are the decisions that interior designers have made in the past? In other words, one of the criticisms about, you know, computer assisted design used to be that it was done at random. And this is very much not at random. This is taking the sum decisions of human experts and rapidly searching through them to produce likely outcomes for these. 
Um, so, you know, one thing you might want to do is actually go and put your, your own home um, floor plan into the system and, and see what it does for you. Now, at the moment, this is just a model. Um, it works, it's very, very impressive, I have to say. But it, uh, as he himself says, um, he notes that the current output is pixel-based. But he then goes on to say that the resulting images produced in our pipeline cannot for now be used directly by architects and designers. Transforming this output from a raster image to a vector format is a crucial step for allowing the above pipeline to integrate with common tools and practices. By which I mean that, you know, at the moment he's producing, you know, a, a, a PIC, a, you know, a, a PNG or something of the furniture layout. But if that was vectorized, there's no reason why it shouldn't be a construction map or an engineering drawing showing where, you know, in other words, once you've got that next step in place, this will then be able to produce a whole, a massive amount of work in architectural practices. So, um, are we looking at an end to prototyping? You know, the thing about prototyping, as you try and increase the fidelity, in other words, how close it is to the final design and the resolution, the, the, the uh, amount of detail in it, costs increase, you know. Um, Having said that, we absolutely do need those functions of prototypes I identified a few slides ago in the design process. They're absolutely crucial, you know, particularly the communication and the working out of design details. Now, the thing about AI is it really can make this bit much cheaper because it can work from handwritten sketches to give you a prototype website or a prototype mobile app. It can work from, you know, just some rough sketches to generate rapidly with, with some choices you, the designer can make um, to produce a finished um, floor plan with furniture and uh, in, in interior design, which is based on what good designers and interior designers have done in the past. In other words, for a lot of purposes, it will be good enough. Um, you know, it, it may not produce your signature building, but it will certainly produce you a good solid municipal building, which has got the learning embedded in it of thousands and thousands of other such buildings. And lastly, of course, AI can also help with the exploration of, of these massively parametric design spaces, you know, designing, um, uh, you know, a housing estate, which the process I looked at can do just by changing itself. Um, you know, there's lots of things to consider. And actually, the designer is given power over those things through this AI system. Um, and so just to finish off, you know, in terms of the implications for employment, um, I think that the phase of the design process that will be most affected is the prototyping phase. Um, and I think that, you know, we are going to see high fidelity, high resolution artifacts produced straight from sketches, possibly a number of sketches, um, by AI-based um, modification. And, you know, in low and mid-range applications, we're not going to see people making things anymore. They're not going to be coding or modeling. They're not going to be producing lighting or prototypes, you know, uh, or, or physical prototypes. Those are going to be done directly by AI straight through to 3D printing, um, you know, uh, prototype code and that sort of thing. Um, and I think for low end stuff, we're going to see no more professional designers used exactly as with graphic design, you know, simple animations, simple architecture, simple apps. We won't have professional coders anymore. Uh, and I think, you know, it's interesting, actually, just today, just before the talk this morning, I was, I was looking through stuff um, and some research was reported that actually over the last three years, the ratio of research to the designers in UX firms has stayed constant. But the proportion of developers is half. In other words, over just three years, there are only half as many developers as there used to be in those firms. Um, so we can, you know, triangulation, I can see that happening already. And, and I've got a point there about training. You know, the trouble is we use this apprentice type, this intern model of training a lot throughout the design industry. If we've got far fewer designers, and actually if the design process itself is much less transparent, because the AI is just doing it, and we're just saying, oh, like that, don't like that bit, you know. What's that going to mean for training? I think it's going to make the training more difficult and, and much more partial. It's going to be easy to get training as a, a designer, you know, as, as a, a researcher, or, or as someone who actually deals with, you know, clients, but um, it may be more difficult to actually get that hand-on experience of design. Okay, there's a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but thank you. Okay, hey, great. Thanks, Ian. Um, so uh, we're a little we're a little behind time. There is actually a question for you, Ian, 
in the chat, but we need to move on. So perhaps you can reply to Vanya's query just in the yes. chat. If that's okay. Yep. Um, yep. So I'm going to hand over now to Tula, who's going